Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. I'm your host, Phil Black. And if you have an 8th, ninth, or 10th grader with big aspirations like the Ivy League or military service academies like West Point, ROTC, or athletic scholarships, boom, you've come to the right place. My specialty, my superpower, if you will, is preparing families for these competitive programs. I'll teach you what your child should do, when they should do it, and how you can help. So stick around and prepare to out-prepare. Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. In today's episode, I want to address the ascendancy of the AP exam, which, though still optional, is now becoming one of the few standardized tests left where students can really demonstrate their academic chops. We will learn why AP classes and AP exams now have taken center stage in the admissions process almost overnight, particularly for students who want to compete at the more selective colleges and programs. Let me break it down. When colleges evaluate applications at some point, they need to compare students across different types of schools, be it private, public, charter, magnet schools, homeschooling, different parts of the country, different socioeconomic conditions, even different countries. They need data. And for the data to be useful, there needs to be a common standard from which the students can be compared. Well, these days, these data points, for good or for bad, are dwindling before our eyes. Let me do a quick review here. Number one, the SAT and ACT, which were given around the world for decades and which aimed to provide an objective measure on how students performed on this type of exam, is no longer required when applying to most colleges and universities, at least for now. So this objective standard with decades and decades of historical data that helped to compare students' achievement from Alaska to Florida and everywhere in between with the exact same questions and answers that helped admissions officers get a feel for the academic prowess of a student is no longer required. Number two, SAT subject tests, which aimed to test mastery of high school level content in things like US history, chemistry, math, biology, and allowed for an across the board comparison among students from all over the country and all over the world have now been canceled. Number three, the essay section of the SAT, which really was the only sample of real-life contemporaneous writing skills. We're not talking about a college essay here that's endlessly edited by an adult for week after week, but a true, albeit imperfect, writing sample in a student's own words, in their own handwriting, has now been canceled. And number four, finally, a student's GPA used to be a quasi-measure, a pretty reliable measure of a student's performance in the classroom that could be compared across the country. Back when there was no such thing as a 4.9 GPA, for instance, the standard measure used to be a 4.0. If you were a 4.0 student back in the day, everybody knew that you received all A's across the board. And that was quite impressive, and everybody knew it. But as we all know today, this is hardly the case. Today, when somebody says they're a 4.0 student, people wonder what happened? Where did they go wrong? Thanks to the rise in weighted classes, honors classes, AP classes, college classes, that old 4.0 standard has gone away. So now, GPA is no longer a reliable measure of student performance in the classroom. But wait, it gets worse. The pandemic has made it even harder to use GPA as a measure with any meaning whatsoever. The discrepancies in teaching methods, whether in person or remote, grading criteria, are students even getting grades or just pass fail, and rampant grade inflation, so students don't feel bad. These things are rendering comparisons of GPAs almost impossible. Now, to be fair, yes. College admissions officers do have the ability to assess a student's GPA within the context of their particular high school. But this is very labor intensive. And yes, at the more selective colleges, admissions officers 
rarely take the GPA at face value, but instead they dig into the specific classes that are taken, the grading policies, the teaching methodology. But what about the other 95% of colleges that don't have the time, the expertise, the resources, or the manpower to do this type of research and digging? They're left with a near meaningless number. We have lost almost overnight multiple objective data points that have been used for decades to evaluate and compare students. SAT and ACT, gone. SAT subject test, gone. SAT essay section, gone. GPA may as well be gone. So where does this leave us? Enter AP classes and AP exams. As most of us know, AP courses are theoretically college-level courses given in high school. They require more work, a higher level of engagement, and more overall academic rigor. And of course, most of us have also heard or seen or have experience with students who now take five or six AP courses at a time. And we've heard about some of the stress and anxiety that this produces in some students. And yes, there is an AP exam available at the end of these classes, which is supposed to measure your mastery of that college content. And for those who don't know, submitting AP exam results, which is based on a grading system between one and five, five being the highest grade, when you're submitting these results to colleges, it's not required at many colleges. In fact, I don't think there's any colleges that require applicants to submit their AP exam scores. Unless, of course, you're trying to get college credit for a particular course, in which case, before matriculating, you do have to prove some level of proficiency on these exams. But otherwise, it's technically not required. So there are a lot of students who take AP classes to bump up their GPA. We call that AP spiking. And to enhance the optics of their transcript, you might call that window dressing. But they never intend to take some of the AP exams or all of the AP exams. Well, I think those days are probably over for a few good reasons. Number one, there is now such a lack of objective data that it's oftentimes in the student's best interest to score well on some kind of standardized test that can be used to compare them to others. How else will they stand out, especially if they're talented academically? And two, since there have been instances of widespread grade inflation, even in AP courses, scoring well on the AP exam, which is the same for everyone, should give you a leg up versus others who didn't do as well on the actual exam, but they got A's in the class. The exam results may become the final arbiter of how much you learned the material in that class, as opposed to your letter grade, especially if everyone in the class gets A's. With so little to work with, I think college admissions officers will become less forgiving of students who take six AP classes, but only take one or two AP exams. They may wonder, what was the student trying to hide? Why didn't they take the test that would objectively show how much they learned? And if that same student also decided not to submit an SAT or ACT score, then the admissions officer is really going to be scratching their head and they might get a little suspicious. This is not what you want happening. In the past, skipping AP exams wasn't as big a deal because they weren't required, and there were a number of other tests to focus on, the SAT, the ACT, SAT subject tests, the essay portion of the SAT, and the GPA, not anymore. So what does all this mean? Well, the takeaway is that sophomores and juniors who are taking AP classes should think long and hard about their AP exam strategies. The strategy of skipping their AP exams may not be such a great idea anymore. And if that's the case, now would be the time to start buckling down because those AP exams are only a few months away. Instead of just focusing on AP exams in the classes that align with intended majors, which used to be the conventional wisdom, if you're a math person, you would take the, the AP calculus test. If you were an English person, humanities person, you might take the AP English literature exam. 
they may want to redouble their efforts in all of their AP classes and take all of the AP exams in an attempt to build a wider and more reliable picture of their academic strengths. If you adopt the strategy, however, of taking a lot of these AP exams to prove to people that you've mastered the content, please do not attempt to also take the SAT or ACT in the spring. Because as I mentioned earlier, most of the AP exams will be given between this year, I believe it's May 3rd and June 11th. If you are a junior, I highly recommend not trying to study for multiple AP exams and also schedule an SAT or ACT in the month of May and June. It's too much. Of course, this is why inside Preple Academy, it's my strong suggestion to get your ACT or SAT out of the way in the beginning of junior year, preferably in October or November. That's why you have to study over the summer please check out my blog or previous podcasts where I lay out this strategy in great detail. Or enroll in Preple Academy, where you get weekly video lessons from me that go over all of these tips in a timely and systematic way so that you don't miss something. This is not something that you want to be surprised by. For those students out there who are soon to solidify their classes for next year, keep this new development in mind. If you don't want to be stuck, taking an AP exam in a subject that you're not really interested in, maybe it would be better to skip the AP class and instead take an honors class, which does not come with an expectation to take an AP exam that's going to be compared across the country. Or on the other hand, if you're sick of this process, removing weapon after weapon from your academic arsenal, maybe you want to take even more AP exams than you would have normally and prepare to crush those AP exams to give those admissions officers something to chew on. I wish all of you good luck with your class selection for next year. That's all I've got for you today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your continued support. Please, if you know a parent with an eighth grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, 11th grader in high school that might find this information helpful, please share the episode with them. You can do that by finding that small box with the tiny arrow that points up. That's the share button. Click that button, text your friends a link to this episode, ask them to take a listen to it. If you have questions, comments, an idea for an upcoming episode, please reach out to me by email, DM me on Instagram, check out our blog, Facebook, connect with me on LinkedIn, you name it, I'd love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by PrepWell Academy. PrepWell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your ninth or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week, every Sunday, in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to PrepWellAcademy.com and enroll your child today.